We're going live. So welcome to welcome to Jersey and this Steve. The Funky Friday at five. And this this time normally I would play my theme music, my funky Friday theme music at the piano, but uh in instance we have a guest and I don't um don't want to detain him too long. Um I don't know how I would describe you truly independent, true, the real deal, real independent filmmaking and artistic creation. John Jost, since 1963, and it's now 2021. And he's still making things. He's not, I mean, you're not only just, not only making films, but poetry. This is a new, um, well, maybe it's not new, that maybe you've always been a poet, but. I think this is a more recent release, right? Well, I, I was a, I wrote since I was a teenager, but I'm embarrassed by it all. Well, okay, but in I'm any of that- certain I wrote the most horrible direct back then, and perhaps I'm writing the most horrible direct now, but I, I simply wouldn't know because I don't know anything about poetry. <laughs> well, what do you mean when you say you don't know? Well, that that's what raises a whole bunch of questions, but, but, but welcome to our show. We could talk about- um, what poetry is. I mean, the only thing I'll say about your poems, having read them, is that they're they're highly political, and and they're um, they're they're um, about about topical events that are very urgent, and so that that's an element in the poems of my limited understanding. But then again, that's in the films too, but um, in a different way. But I I appreciate that. So, John, what were you thinking you wanted to discuss? You're in New York. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, and you're New York City. Is there anything you want to say up front that comes to your mind? Or, um... uh, I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm in New York, uh, sort of. Now it's been over, uh, what? Um, I was intending to go to Europe last March. Wow. You know, and then, and then... COVID threw the wrench in the works. Right, right. And since then, I've been bouncing around, uh, yeah. staying with friends, uh, uh, you know, right. waiting for, for the window to open so I could go. And yeah. hypothetically, I'm going to go in the middle of next month. But, you know, we'll see what clamp down or new virus <laughs> whatever yeah. comes along to... Uh, to uh, but my life, I've always, uh, I, I tell my friends, you know, I'm a feather in the wind, you know? Yeah. I go here, I go there, you know? Well, do you, you mind if, do you mind if I ask you a question about that? Because it was that movie, that Oscar winning movie last year, Nomadland, right? Uh huh. Did you? I didn't see, but I know about it. Well, I mean, in a sense, you, you've been living a life similar to that for decades, wouldn't you say? I mean, eight, I mean, uh, is that fair to say, or is that, did you? Uh, I think I've been living like that since I was twenty. Okay. I mean, I know I don't. I have no home. I have lots of homes. That's interesting. Like I, I consider almost every place I've lived as a kind of home. Right. I, 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 I don't. I can't. You know how many cities I've lived in in the countryside and small towns? It must be twenty. And I'm talking about places wow. that I live for. A year, two, three, and sometimes five years. Five years is pushing my limit. You know, usually. Well, yeah. I, I have enormous respect for that. Um, I think there's a lot more there than people realize. I mean, just to name one example, you know, you're, I remember I was very impressed with your Los Angeles movies, Chameleon and Angel City and that beautiful house in Chameleon and the way you shot there. But I'm thinking, you know, you were just there for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Rembrandt laughing, San Francisco, what a beautiful period. You know, the people in that film, Nate Dorsky, and the, the, just a, uh, um, so you, you, I guess you've lived in places, all the Vermeers in New York, and you make really terrific films. And those films are almost like you're, you're so you're living in a place and a film comes out of it. And sometimes a really, really strong film. So that's really interesting. I mean, that you. I, I, hope, it. I hope they're very much filmed. They were made because that's very important to me. Yeah. I would, never, I would never think up of a story and say, well, where shall we stick this? Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I always go to am, get, I'm in a place, think about it, feel it, explore it, and then out comes something. 
And then you were in Portland, Oregon with my friend Greg Tosian, who's in one of your movies. I haven't heard him, and I miss Greg terribly. And he was, as you know, he was one of my. Have you heard anything? Because I wrote him, and I did not get a response. You too, huh? Yeah. Same thing. I, Greg, where are you? Greg, I, Greg Tosian. Yeah. And I did. Uh, these days, I, you know. Will write an older friend or what? He, I, I don't think he's not as old as I am, but he just turned seventy this year. Right, and you know, if I don't get an answer after a bit, I start looking at obits. <laughs> wow. That's true. I mean, that's my yeah. first reaction after. Usually, I'll write somebody two emails, and if I don't get a response, then I go, "Well, I better check the obits or ask somebody from that area." But he, he, you know, he originally is from Florida, but but I didn't know him from there. And, you know, I fear for the worst. You know, I know he's alive. And the last I heard is that he's in Tampa. Well, Do you know with a lot of stuff in Tampa? That's all I know. But that's that's the limit of my... shirt was in Tampa? Oh, yeah. Well, that's where he grew up. You know, he's from Tampa. Yeah, I know, but I, when, I, when he was going to go off, I think he said uh, Gainesboro. That's where the university is, or a university is. Yeah. And I think he was going to move up there, and he had some... Some relative who something there was some reason to go there, but it wasn't. Right. I know it wasn't Tampa that he was saying because I have friends in Tampa and I would have. Okay. Been. I mean, I, I don't want to get too too far in details about where in Florida, but I, I guess the reason I mentioned this is um, I wanted to ask you about the relationship between living temporarily as in, in a nomadic way. Yeah. In your artistic practice, there's some deep relationship there. And I don't know if that interests you to discuss that or if that's important to you at all, but it just struck me I just now in the, in the, in the flow of. Well, uh, I think my problem is I have some mode of, a, what do they call it? A, attention deficit, something rather disorder. You do? Okay. I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not able to do anything for a consistently long period of time. Okay. So, if I'm making something, if I'm painting, I can do that for a few hours and then I got to go write a poem or take a walk or do some editing. And that happens on both the short term and long term okay. frequencies. So if I'm doing something during the day, it's I'm very unlikely to do the same thing all day long because I'll get bored with it and then okay. I do something else. And I think the same happens on a lower frequency a longer range frequency that, uh, you know, I can live in a place for a year or two and then I feel like I want to go to a new place. And uh, I do think, uh, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I seem to have, a, in my view, inexplicably highly sensitive social antenna. So I pick up on the vibe of a place and I don't go do research. I, I mean, I never go do clinically what other people would consider research. And and because I'm poor, I can hardly ever go in anything. <laughs> Why don't so, really? Okay, but, so. What I get us walking on the streets and going into the places that, you know, are free. <laughs> and, uh, but somehow I pick up on whatever the, you know, reality of wherever I am is. And when I make a film, people will, will, I remember making a film in Butte, Montana. Which yeah. At the time, which at the time I made that film, it was Bell Diamond in 19. That's right. 86 or something like that. Um, and, you know, I was there for summer and I met people and it was a, all the people in the cast, except for one were from Butte and the one who wasn't ended up settling in the Butte. So now he's from yeah. Butte. <laughs> and, um, and I was only there for uh, three or four months and okay. I engaged the people. And I remember one of the nicest compliments I think I can ever have when somebody sees one of my films, uh, somebody in Portland, I, I was doing a screening in Portland and somebody came to it just because they heard that it was shot in Butte. And he okay. came up afterwards and said, you got it, right? That I made a, you know, a, a person from Butte looked at the film and said, you got some essential something about Butte. Absolutely, so that's like to me the best compliment I can have. Is yeah, that. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a follow up compliment. The newer film that I saw in a rural area, it's a new, one of the new, one of the I don't remember which one. Dead ends, possibly, but I'm not sure. Well, give me give me a rough idea of what's in it. 
What I, well, what I wanted to say about this film is that your shots of location, yeah. so the, these dead malls or these parking lots or these these kind of um, I think you're talking about tourists. Tourists too. Los Angeles, Washington. Right. Well, you have things in that film that most filmmakers aren't even dealing with in terms of depicting what life is. Do you know what I mean? There's a certain, you're really showing something about the layout, the design, the way people are living and, and putting a spotlight on that and all of its strangeness and eeriness. And I just was really struck by that. Um, you have a commitment to documenting that, which is interesting because it's not documentary film, it's fiction film. But there's an element of um, truthfulness or sort of reportage. I, does that make, is that, I don't know if that's, you know, maybe that's all part of how you, you work or what you're trying to express. But in both of, both of those films, I saw that. And I thought, wow, you're capturing something that's, um, that's getting um, it neglected or isn't being, isn't being, um, getting neglected or isn't being discussed by, in, what, do you? What well, do you, that's what I try to do. I mean, as I say, I, you know, I, I, I don't think up of, a, I, I never think up of stories, period. Okay. I go to a place. One way or another, I get familiar with it. In that, in the, the film that was shot in Port Angeles, tourists. Yeah. Um, uh, my friend who I was staying with, who's been in four or five of my films, I forget. And maybe that was his fifth film for me. Okay. He was in. He was in. He, right. he, play, he played the the therapist. Um, right. And uh, I stayed there six months again. COVID had something to do with it. Right. And, right. Uh, uh, and he's a mental health therapist. That's right. He worked with a place that specialized in the family, right. domestic problems, abuse, yeah. drug, divorces. Sure. Beat up by her husband or wife. Yeah. Um, and he liked to cook. He, he, he's an excellent cook and he likes to cook. And his partner, who lived in Portland, unfortunately died a couple of months ago. Oh, wow. He, well, in his early 50s, he, he came up with a um, exotic um, a lymph cancer and it did him in like, you know, yeah. diagnosed in April, died in June. Yeah. And uh, uh, anyway, Steve, Steve would go there, commute. Every two weeks, he would drive to Portland to be with his partner for a long weekend, and otherwise. And so he he liked to cook. And if if he was on his own, he would just go get a pizza and slam it in his mouth. But if he had someone to cook for, right. then he was. That was his most his most favorite thing to do in life was to cook, and he was a very good cook. So I was treated to, you know. Five star restaurant type eating and he likes the whole thing cooking right. well presenting it making it look beautiful right and, and I, I sort of had a, a, a funny thing happen because then I, I left there and uh, spent the summer in Butte where I was the cook mm -hmm. uh, for my friends but nothing so elegant and then I ended up ending with my cousin in Boston Huh. Expecting to spend a month or two before I went to Europe and then COVID right. lockdowns and all that happened. Yeah. And she is just as much of a cook as Steve was. Mm -hmm. And has the same, like, although she will cook just for herself and make a beautiful present. Oh, wow. That's real connect. That's real. With, with, with Steve, it was sort of like, well, I didn't feel guilty because I knew I was giving him what he liked to do the most. Right? Uh -huh. Which he wouldn't do if I wasn't there. Then he'd just go get a pizza. And, and his favorite thing in the world to do is to cook. So yeah. I, I gave him ample opportunity to cook for someone else. Wow. And uh, in, in Boston, uh, it wasn't, you know, she would have cooked for herself anyway, but she mm -hmm. did like having someone in the kitchen to talk with and whatever. And um, But it was sort of like going from the frying pan into the fire of going from one really good cook to another <laughs> <laughs> and they're all just feeding me. Oh, it, it, it's really. Since I got to New York. I've lost around five or ten pounds. Well, that's 
if you were if you were intending to do that, then that's good, I guess. If that's if no, that I wasn't was intending, but you know, no. I, I knew I got to put on. I didn't put on much weight in Boston, but because no. you know, but uh, you know, get. I'm not just, usually I eat once a day, and in Boston, she would have a a kind of brunch, and then a, a, and then but a full dinner, the whole thing, right, everything, from cocktails to. Well, that's a, that's beautiful because that's a that's a way of making I guess making a film that's directly connected to the people in your life, or that you know someone's in a so there are th scenes of therapy, and he's a real therapist rather than having a, a, an actor play a you know very well, it certainly makes it better. He was a real very therapist. John Job. Actually, yeah. Half of that movie, mm -hmm. half of the content of the movie, it wasn't like something I was unfamiliar with. Right. I would discuss with him. Technically, we weren't supposed to do that. You know what happened what, with his cases of a day, and this was over six months. So I heard a lot of really horrible things yeah. that happened behind your closed doors. Sure. And, uh, Abuse. And all that kind of seeped in and became basically half the content of the movie was about. That. Well, it's. I, I should say it's a beautiful film, tourists. And I again, I don't know. I recommend to to the listeners audience that they watch this film. It's um it's just I think it's it, oh, well, you have a chat thing here. What happened? You have a chat thing here. I'm okay. going to put a note. I'm going to put uh how they can uh how how anybody who's watching can Oh, I see. Um well you can put in uh direct it's on Vimeo but um but I wanted to come back to this issue of place and geography, if you don't mind. Again, yep, it's fine. Because of, because of Antonioni, Michelangelo Antonioni, I feel yep. I feel that you you may have gotten that from him, but I'm not sure. But um, well, I, I, uh, 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 what I'm saying is, uh, 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 so one of my pet peeves is the suburbanization of this country and the, the soullessness and deadness of what that does to people if you follow mm -hmm. me. and your film you films talk about that i mean i don't know if it's 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 not you know what i mean so you're actually i'm like wow you're actually addressing that in a visual way is that true i mean that's something that is, you know not to get too too dramatic but i'm like goodness that's something that i know that you're, you're well, i'm a very visual person you know, I paint yeah. I do photography and my movies are very visually oriented. And that's how I tend to show things more than right. than talking or whatever. Right? Yeah. And I think if you show things in a I won't say a good way, in in, in a in a certain way, right. uh, you it's very revealing of whatever's going yeah. on in that place. Right. Uh, so, but it, to me, it's always very, very important. The place is mm -hmm. usually before I make a film. Um, you've seen the bed you sleep in, I think. I love yes, more than once. Um, yeah. yeah, like there, you know, I, uh, I, I knew I, I was looking for a certain. I was looking for a lumber town. That was I needed right. a lumber town because in Oregon, that's a major right. business. And I had a friend, a filmmaker friend, Ron Finney, gave me a list of, you know, well, here's our lumber town. Here's, right. and, and, but it, he didn't include the one I ended up in. Okay. So I went to the towns he suggested, and they were all usually in flat places. And for something in me, didn't want that. Right. And I remember coming over the crest of a hill going to the coast for, to Newport, Oregon. And going over the crest of this hill about 15 miles inland. And mm -hmm. here's this town, Toledo, and it was built on a hillside going down to a river lagoon type thing where there was a pulp plant with yeah. smoke. And, and I, I just remember just going over the crest of the hill and going in my mind, this is it. Yep. And, and then I nosed around and I said, yep, this is it. And then I went and checked into a motel in a cheapo, a motel that Ken Kesey used to go to. Oh yeah, that that, that they've unfortunately it's been torn down. It was wow. a bunch of little blue cabins, and there was a, a two-story blue cabin in the middle. Right, that's where he he checked into right, 
and uh, wow. all torn down now, unfortunately, because it's very charming. But you, 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 that's in the bed you sleep in, right? So that's uh, a, no. In the frame up has some of that, that. Of that motel. I, I didn't shoot it. Not, the bed you sleep in is all in Toledo. Well, the, the yeah. thing I the thing I really want to say is that those circular shots in the bar. So the observatory and is it San Francisco? The observatory and that beautiful sort of weird your rom com, your concept of uh, with what's his name? He's still uh, you know the film I'm speaking of in the observatory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that Bell Diamond or is that um, no? That's um. The, the observatory is in Rembrandt laughing. No, excuse me. It's in slow moves. Slow so moves. Okay. It starts off in San Francisco right. and ends in the Sierra foothills. And the, and that bar that that very um, the bar the, and the bar the bar is Rembrandt laughing and that's and Last bar. Chance. It's a sushi bar. bar. Last... Well, there's there's Last yeah. Chance as a bar scene. Right. And. Rembrandt laughing has a sushi bar scene where it was one of those things where the 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 sushi comes around a little channel with a boat on it and you pick your sushi mm -hmm. off of it and I put my camera on it so my camera went around where the sushi would have gone and looked at the. Oh, well, I guess what I want to say is that I, as a human being, watching the film, get a feeling about these places, and and it, because of the way it's shot and it communicates something to me. And it's actually quite profound. It's actually something you might want to say about America or about. And I don't, again, I, I think it's only in the doing of that and the attention and the commitment to doing that. Other filmmakers don't do, you see what I mean? It's like, so you, so clearly it's, um, it, it has, a, it has a result or has an effect on the viewer. And I, um, and I, and I think that maybe is, um, I think that's maybe one of the uh, things art is for, maybe to get to get not to be too hopefully uh, pretentious about it, but that's um. But I feel I feel that, and I I feel that that's in your work is one is the only thing, and it is connected to place. And I guess I was wondering, it's connected to how you live, right? The way you, the way you relate to geographies and. In the story. Part, yeah. part of the, the, the way I live is part, as I say, I think I have very sensitive social antenna. Okay. And, and I think I, I, usually I would never go someplace and start doing something immediately. Right. I know then I'll be dealing with superficial shit. Right. I have to stay in a place for a while and mm. sort of clear out the obvious stuff and start to see what's underlying. One of my, one thing I find funny is that. And this has to do with something with about cinema and how um, programmed we are by cinema. Ron, John, hold that thought. You know, the, you know, the only other filmmaker I think that does what you do is Fred Wiseman. I think Frederick Wiseman has that kind of integrity. I don't know what you think. I mean, when he, but anyhow, I just you don't want to hear what I think. <laughs> you probably don't like Fred Wiseman. <laughs> he does do that. Go ahead. I need to go to sleep. I'll watch a Fred Weisman. Well, all right. <laughs> I like uh, it. No, it, it, it's like one thing that amused me was that uh, that after I met all the Vermeers in New York, yeah, uh, all these people said, "Ah, oh, that's not a New York film." <laughs> and, I went, and I was like, "Oh, because you you want Scorsese's Mean Streets and the Lower East Side punk yeah. world." Which is there, right? Yeah. Well, but there's also the Metropolitan Museum and and the stock market and all that. That's also there. That's just as New York as, as you know, screaming and shouting in Little Italy. Right. And I just found it funny because most, aside from Woody Allen, who makes uh, an, all, an all white version of New York, mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any blacks in all the rare mirrors, but it wasn't dealing with that. <laughs> but. but uh, well, that's a that's good. That raises a whole profound question about you know, what is a New York film, right? So I mean, if you're asking me, Mitch Hampton, yeah, all the Vermeers in New York is as much a New York film. It's certainly more of a New York film in, than many Woody Allen films. I actually go further. It's as much of a New York film as Mazursky's Unmarried Woman or anything, anything, or. Girlfriends, another great. I would rank girlfriends and all the Vermeers in New York together as great New York films. But I think the important thing is that New York is such a capacious place, right? I mean, if you show a part of New York, 
I think you're no, showing nobody could possibly show New York. There's that too. I mean, it's just it would be a fool's errand. Like, it's fool's here, errand. Here's New York. I said, no, you could spend a whole lifetime. I mean, there are, you know, people spend whole lifetimes, and if you're lucky, if you can excavate a little corner of it. Yeah. I mean, it's too too dense with too many things, and there's you would go crazy trying to cover it all. You know. And there are but, a lot of crazies on the streets here. I mean, one, thing, one thing I'll say additionally about all the premieres in New York, it's actually a really a good movie about the 80s. The nice so if somebody want to say, you know, show me the the I don't know, the fucked upness or the or the um the glamour of the 80s or any of it, that that you couldn't pick a better, you know, artistic representation than your all the premieres in New York, I think, you know. Stephen Lack, but yeah. Belatedly, I think some people are coming around to that. When, okay. I, when I made it, it was sort of like Americans weren't allowed to make movies like that. If, if, if Romare had made that movie, they all would have gone, yay. Yeah. But, but he's not American. <laughs> you think it's a, it's a regional, kind of a regionalism or sort of a, a weird? Um... It, it's just, you know, it's. I, I think a lot of it in the movie world is people are so programmed to, to think that Movies in New York about the mafia, gangsters, rough street yeah. life, punks, anything, you know, and, and you know, there is, who's that film like, who I don't happen to like? There is an Upper East Side guy who made a handful of movies. Whit Stillman. Um, St yeah, Whit Stillman, is that in? I like Whit Stillman's films. I know you yeah. don't. We can disagree on things, but, but yeah. I, I, I'm inordinately prejudiced. Right, right. <laughs> You brought him up. Why? Because he does capture his people, or right? he does depict his. Right. So no, I mean, yeah. I don't. That's. So there are the you know there are people who gets into their little pocket of right of, uh, New York and portray yeah. it honestly. I think. Right. And um, I did my little pocket because yeah. that's a little. I I just happened at the time to be a Vermeer junkie. So. I hope that didn't stop. You're huh? still, I hope you're still a Vermeer. I hope that doesn't write Vermeer's for well, I'm I'm more critical of him now. No, I'm not. No, tell me about that. Why is that? Well, well, have you read about this this uh, Vermeer that they uh, somewhere where was that Dresden or somewhere they had a Vermeer and they did a critical analysis of it and then they yeah. scraped off this thing where they had a plain wall behind a woman reading the letter and it turns out there's a Cupid and and this painting behind it that was yeah. his original thing. Yeah. And uh, the, the thing, Vermeer is interesting because there's no sketches, there's no preliminary paintings, there are no, and he obviously, very obviously used a camera obscura. Uh, to, so he was basically tracing. And that shows up in as some of his. There's one in uh, Braunschweig in Germany in a right. city, uh, with a, a, a girl with two officers and one officer in the background. It's very interesting how he's in the background. His, his, it's like he has a film of something over him that makes him more distant. It's like, uh -huh. it's like a layer of fog. It's, well, it was painted. This is what he meant. Right. And then the other officer is close to this woman and they're both holding wine glasses. Yeah. And the woman has her wine glass up to her face, and she has the most weird, awkward, on one level, awful, not that she looks bad, but she's badly painted. <laughs> oh. And he has a few, his, his, thing, his human figures are, in general, quite wooden and not believable, uh, because I don't think he was a natural painter. He was, he, he could copy what the thing did, but he didn't have that natural flow of giving life to something, <laughs> with the exception of those close-up portraits which work wonderfully right. but but when they were in the context of this he reminds me a bit in it, it's in the same thing that uh, edward hopper like edward hopper not edward hopper though is very I um, well i do too but i think he's a bad painter We'll see. I want, well, that's a wonderful a, artist and a bad painter. So that's it. Well, that's a, see, that's a right, now, I, right now, I just went the other day to, to uh, yeah. just yesterday, was it yesterday yeah. or the day before, 
there's a big exhibition in the art gallery uh, of uh, Philip Guston. Love Philip. I, I love Philip I, Guston too. No, I have the, whoa, whoa. Um, where is it? See that? That's a Stephen Trepanides, and that was one of Phil Guston's pri prize. I don't want to. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to. Um, you know, so Hopper and Guston are similar in that they're both, in some senses, bad painters. Like they don't really know how to do a convincing human body. Their bodies are always wooden yeah. and not believable. Both of them have really, uh, you know, like, you know, I like it, but I would still say it's, you know, by normal criteria of what people think a painter should or can do. They both do terrible brushwork. And with Gustin, the, the painting is the brushwork, but it's terrible brushwork. <laughs> well, well, so there's this irony that you sit there and say, okay, you have these, these painters who have some kind of, including Vermeer, whose brushwork is exquisite. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but he doesn't really know how to do a human figure. And, right. and when, if you're going to portray a human figure, you should, it should have some animation, some life to it. And his human figures tend to be kind of wooden and just like hoppers. But despite yeah. the bad things, you know, so I look at them, I say, well, they're bad painters, but they're wonderful artists. Because somehow they take... Again, that's an interesting distinction. I don't feel... You're, you're the guest on my show. And I love the fact that you come on my show and you're going to say something like that because that's you're expressing something of a, of a truth or something you feel. I have to confess I don't fully understand it because I don't think I'm prepared. Because first of all, I haven't done the work to think about philosophically the distinction you, you're making. And it's a their very deep point. So I will concede that you've, you've said it and there's something there. And I'm willing to think about that in, in a certain, but I'm not prepared. I love Gustin, I, I, but yeah. I look at it as a, you know, I paint also. Uh, yeah. and, and, and by normal criteria, you know, things that- well, that's, the thing, that's the thing I don't quite, so I don't believe, see, I actually don't believe in criteria. In a normal criteria? I don't believe, actually, I don't even believe in criteria. Because for me, again, this is something, um, I have to tread delicately here because it because you know um, I don't I don't so I it isn't that I I don't think that our all art is equal clearly right on the other hand the notion of criteria for me is um, um, well I mean there is criteria like what so the reason why I love Fred Wiseman as a filmmaker you, he puts you to sleep but for me he's a wonderful filmmaker is that in terms of what he's trying to do, he succeeds and he's painting a portrait of America visually that no, you know, is just incredible. And that's what I go to him for. So for me, the, the, the function Did of- Do you feel the same way about James Benning? You like James Benning more than I do. I would well, say, I, I, I certainly- I like him. I, I, For me, he's very hit and miss, but I, I, I like a lot of his stuff, and I think that's what he's 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 doing a broader portrait of America than than what's his name and Fred Wiseman. I see. I wouldn't. Agree. But, but 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 here's the difference. See, Wiseman is interested in people and people talking and social exchange. That's Wiseman. Yeah. yeah. Banning is not as interested in that. It's more abstract. But 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 again, James Benning is a genius. So I mean, no, really. I mean, James Benny. Believe that, in the concept. Well, I know you don't, but but, I, but <laughs> what I'm saying is that, and I know some of Benning's students, Miley Colbert, she's been yeah. on my show, and and, and um, Rick Link, Rick, uh, Richard Link, like made a film with James Benning, and he's certainly a. But you know, I think a lot of these things are subjective. So even genius might be subjective. I don't All know. All things are subjective. Right, but I think when you're talking about what you go to a work of art for, I do think Very that it's subjective. Well, but also objective because something either delivers or doesn't something, right? So, my, so in other words, well, but that's subjective. No, but the delivery isn't. The delivery is is in the world. The delivery is something we feel and something 
right? Yeah, but, but I want, you know, right. I may love something and somebody else doesn't get anything. Absolutely, in it. absolutely. So that's and all I, subjective. Well, we're, yeah, but we're back to my dismissal of criteria. I'm thinking okay. criteria it, it is right. okay. Here, here is uh, Walter Keene, a great painter. I don't know his work enough, really. To, to okay, he was a guy who made these horrible portraits of these people with big eyes. Okay. Turns out his wife oh, actually, oh, you mean Margaret King? No, well, his wife actually painted them. Right, that's why I said. <laughs> but there, and then, or, or, let's see, what's the guy's Bob name? Kincaid. The Tom guy. Okay, well, okay, so. You know, okay, so I, I look at that and I say, well, there's criteria. Kincaid no, is a garbage painter. <laughs> right, well. <laughs> and lots of people love the hell out of him. He made a major business out of selling. Oh his yeah, and houses. I just wa I just watched the Bob Ross documentary, which is interesting. But I mean, you know, my show is about everything and everyone. I do really want everybody to get. So, you know, so I mean, I want I want the anti-commercial, and I want the commercial both. I mean, if they want to welcome to my show, and then I give them the. So yeah, of course that's. Um, it took me a while when you said King because I always think about Margaret King. And, yeah, but it's, it's a whole, I mean, that's interesting. So, I, 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 you know, I, the criteria are totally subjective. Yeah, that's true. So anything having, you know, if it's not scientific, it's not, if, if I take my mouse and drop it, it's going to fall because of gravity. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the fuck I think about it. You know. uh, yeah. It, right. that's that's objective right or, yeah uh but but everything else as soon as it's like basically you know and this is why i'm amused by critics especially ones who are oh. full of themselves yeah. and i say basically you're a philistine and you're telling me i like it or i don't like it right and that's, when it when it comes to art of any kind yeah. you know it's really it comes down to i like it i don't like it yeah. and what you like has Sure. If you come back to uh, to um, Gustin, right yeah. now, if so, Gustin comes out of the. I, I'm thinking about him because I went to this show and I want to do an article. Uh, I want to do a big blog post about Gustin. Okay. I, I applied for a grant, which I'm certain, as usual, I'm positive I won't get it. The the Warhol Foundation has an arts writer grant. We do. And I've done a fair amount of writing about art of all kinds on my blogs right you know self-publishing and uh i applied i hope i get it. it's thirty thousand bucks i could use it yeah absolutely but, but so so then they want th their thing is you they want you to deal with they really want you to deal with contemporary artists which we can't say mr gustin is um yeah. uh but anyways so you go back to that period and right. all those people, you know, all the big painters of the 50s and 60s, nearly all of them, with the exception of Warhol, who's younger, actually, yeah. uh, uh, came out of the work projects, you know, and you go back and look at their old work, and they all were basically doing kind of Picasso-esque, yeah. uh, surrealist, this and that, very variation, but also realist, you know. That's right. They're working for the, the, so because workers, of the workers, realism. Right, surrealist, you know, Picasso esque kind of stuff. So, so no, are you are you saying? So, are you saying that we have to take into account the New Deal and the WPA and sort of the the uh, effects of that and take and as as being important? Is that kind of what? Because in terms of their learning and because that is interesting. No, I think that, that allowed is, them to go ahead and be painters. Right. I mean, it was social. It was a governmental support to go ahead yeah. and make art, and it did sort of. Don't you, don't you think like, we could, How about making art about society, you, and then they did, think, they did but, and then they all went. Really, right, right. but John, don't you think? Don't you think we could use something like that now? Wouldn't it be great if we had a WPA now? And you know, you know, I don't know. I just kind of put that. Well, as long as they didn't become propagandists for the government. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> the drop, the downside. Sure. Uh. Anyway, yeah. so so if you go back to that era, you know I think, uh, yeah. and he was reviled. You know, first he he started off in WPA type stuff, and yeah, his painting is very similar to all of them. I mean, they all did the kind of same painting, and then they all diverged in both post-war period mm -hmm. and went off on their own ways. Sure. And and then he, 
you know, in their views, betrayed when he reverted yeah. back to figure stuff after his 50s completely abstracted. But his abstract is very beautiful, too. Oh, I yeah. like all of the, you know, I like once all he got that. past the training period of the WPA stuff, yeah. uh, I like more or less his whole trajectory of how he changed. Yeah. But, you know, he got really trounced in the 70s when he started yeah. doing those things. And now if you go back to it, on because I go to museums and, you know, boy, yeah. there's nothing so fucking tiresome as, as a Klein painting. Um, the ones with huge yeah. black and white slashes of paint. Yeah. Uh, who else? You know, th th they're all are not aging well, right? The only one who I find ages well, I, I, I think Pollock ages well. He's mm. still... And Lee Krasner. On the, under and then let's see, there's a Helen Frankenthaler. Yeah, absolutely. She, I prefer her graphics to her paintings. Oh which yeah, which is interesting. I have a lot of, like, I prefer Edvard Munch's graphics yeah. to his paintings. Right, it's interesting to go. You know, somebody most famous is a painter, and you say, but their graphics are so much. Nice. You know, the, 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 I guess what I'm saying is that there's a certain point of view, John, where, like, Mark Rappaport. Yeah. I saw Scenic Route when I was a child in yeah. 1977 as a boy. Yeah. That's a not a movie a kid's supposed to, really a movie for any, any you know, with my dad. Yeah. <laughs> and I loved it. Go figure. Yeah. There's something in it that spoke to me. Yeah. And so I figured that he, as, as a filmmaker, he has it. And so there is a kind of a, I guess a, it sounds cliche, but there is a certain thing there that you can't. You can't analyze it, right? It's sort of like um, well, you can't analyze it. You can't learn it. You just have yeah. to. You know, my view about artists is like, if somebody has it, well, maybe a little schooling is good for them, right? Uh, but uh, if you don't have it, twenty years and an MFA and a blah 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 won't make you an artist right. you know, or a musician and, um, or anything. You know, it's like either either you can play or you got chops or you don't. And, and if you don't, you know. It yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of an. That's why when I talk about your films, I talk about what's in the film. It frustrates me when people discuss works of art and ignore the art. They talk about extraneous things, and if you notice this thing, they talk about everything but the but the work, and it's like they don't even deal with what's in there. Um, well, the the greatest problem. question for a filmmaker is, what kind of camera did you use? Yeah, <laughs> I mean. Well. It made all the difference. I used a red cam. That's why my <laughs> film was so great. I had the misfortune of using a red cam. I was yeah. doing a, a thing in. I don't know. Yeah. The red cam is is this is extremely exotic, early digital camera. Right. So the people who were not in the camera business, but were. Right. It, it actually it's much more rational than a. You know, it says so, okay, we have this part that receives the image. The lens part of this, so they fragmented it so it's comp comp componential, so that you could change when the technology changed. You could say, mm -hmm. okay, now we go to whatever. We just insert the higher res chip or whatever. Yeah. But it's a horrible camera. <laughs> it's way too, it's it, because it's not a cameraman's camera. It's a technician's camera. Interesting. And and, and I I had it. First off, it weighed a fucking ton. It was too complicated. I said, I just want to take a pic. I don't give a fuck about the 32,000 codex I could use. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I offer a thing about one of the things wrong with the world? <coughs> Excuse me. I had a drink of water. Or, you're right. Actually, I'm going to take advantage of my coughing fit and go get myself another beer. Excellent. <laughs> I'll be right back. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. <laughs> This is a, um, I should say, I should say, uh, John's going to get a, going to get a, um, a drink. I'm going to say, say hi to everybody. Thanks, Laurie, for setting all this up. And if you're out there in Chester and, um, um, Whoops. There we are. Um, oh, there we go. Well, you, you hit your, you hit your na nail, something you said, a technician, a technician's camera. Do you think, do you think what's one of the things wrong with the world? 
is that it's run by, um, maybe it's run by technicians. And they're the, that, 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 that maybe they're the ones kind of in charge. And so they make the world over from a technician's point of view. I just, I'm just throwing, I don't know if I'm thinking out loud, but there may be something to that. Uh, I think the we, we, world it's just run by humans. Well, well, sure, but <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want. Right. To, I would. Well, I mean, I not absolutely to, would not want to leave the running of the world to the discretion of artists and filmmakers. Okay. You know, I wouldn't want to it leave would, it in their it, hands because, yeah, in no. general, they're totally irresponsible people. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, ego-oriented, but they're just like politicians, right? So who needs right. that? More of that. <laughs> well, what, I guess what I mean is that it's a. a, a um, I think I think I guess I'm saying it's lack of heart. You know, lack of feeling is a big problem, uh, and I think that you know, it's just a well, thought. You know? Do Trump followers lack feeling? They have lots. They have a surfeit of feelings, negative feelings. <laughs> they, they well, that's a, that's, a, that's a, yeah. for a good reason. They have, have good reason to want to hate these people, but that's what they're they're, they're operating almost totally on emotion. So I wouldn't want to say. Okay, so th so so that's not quite right either. But you know, if your emotion is hate, and that's your only emotion, that's you know, which is I, I have to say, I do think that's what that is. Is as well, it, is, it, it recurrently takes over the world and does get catastrophic things yeah. like make uh, concentration camps and right. other pleasantries. <laughs> And humans did that, you know, very cultured humans who, who did Beethoven and Bach, right? I mean, I'm really thinking out loud. I'm struggling. Just so, so it isn't about reason versus emotion. But when I say technicians, I guess I'm saying um, something without life or without, you know, so, ca ca you know. I, I how do you pronounce Steve? Is his name pronounced Steve Jobs or Jobs? Steve Jobs, I think. So I, I well, he was a complex, that. complex person. He wasn't all, all technician. He was a deep. But, but, but I, I would like to bring him back and take him to a walk through, through reality. Like here in New York, you know, I get on a subway. I go, I go to a nice park, and virtually everybody in the park is not there. Everybody in the park is. Uh, everybody. I mean, I'm not. Right. There on a park bench on a beautiful day with things going on around mm -hmm. them and they're all like mm -hmm. and I regard I think this is you know I don't know whether that's what he wanted no I mean you go the opposite what, what, he was actually he did is, it is now we have this completely discombobulated world which yeah. we're going to do this to our extinction right we're going to be so busy in our phones going oh look at this yeah. Oh, let me take a selfie. You know that we we're, we're going to we're, we're already over the cliff of extinction, and we're all sitting there stuck in our cell phone. Yeah. And it, okay. it, to me, this this, this you know it, it's a double-edged sword. I use the net a lot. I right. use electronic things a lot, of course. Sure. Well, you, yeah. But I regard it as you know a, a toxic, you know, fatal error. Yeah, you know that because that was somewhere a long time ago. What somebody wrote a book called you know, "Distracting Ourselves to Death" or something. Neil Postman, right? It was using ourselves to death. Television and all that kind of. Oh, stuff. No, 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 wait, wait, don't. You know, I'm a Neil Postman fan. I, you know, I, 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 I never read the book. I just read the. Oh, the oh. I didn't need to read the book. I already. No, well, <laughs> no, but he was far more than that book. Neil Postman was a very deep, he ran the, he, he actually founded, you know, Neil Postman founded a whole department for media, media ecology in the late seventies. Yeah. Nobody else had done that at NYU. And he yeah. was a classicist and brilliant, beautiful, beautiful man. And, and well, Neil Postman predicted all of this because he, because he, he was worried about, um, well, he, 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 he may see Neil Postman, made a distinction between culture and technology. He didn't think they were the same thing. That's and right. he, well, he, he, what he feared was technology replacing culture. He wanted to keep culture alive rather than having culture serve algorithms. And I think that's some, there's something to that.
without getting too far too far afield. But um, so, do you want to say anything about your your book of poetry where people can get it, or how? Um, uh, let's see. Um, I have to. It's on blurb or whatever it is. On blurb. So we'll just help you. I think, it, let, let me look up. I can probably get the. It's. <clears throat> I think if I just let me see. Uh, this pulled I think up. Is my producer's messaging me and saying, saying time's up or what? No, there's no time up. I mean, somebody wants to hear you recite a poem. I don't know if that's. Oh, oh. I don't know yeah. if you do do that or if that's okay. Uh, let me pull up a one that I wrote the last couple of days because that's Absolutely. the only one that's in front of me. Absolutely. Let me, let me see if I – okay, here's one from the last couple of days. All right. Uh, I, I looked by uh, – and probably not finished. What we wanted we never got. Never really knew just what it was. The dangled there out front an orange mirage. Well-trained asses we chased. Buddhas had slipped us by. Bye, bye, bye was our mantra, but it never bought us happiness. It was a crude. For the last bye, bye, smiles. Should have listened to this. That makes sense? John, John, you have to do that again because we got a, a technical glitch. You're coming. Okay. So we need to sort of. Take a pause, and now you're frozen. I don't know if there's there's um. um Do you remember? Let, well, you don't because you're too too young. Oh, I'm um, fifty. There was a movie in the early fifties where the where the uh, the villain. There was a contest about can you name the monster, and the monster right. was a frozen carrot. Right. <laughs> Are we okay? Yeah. Now let's Are do we, it. I'm, so you I'm said something about the orange. Pardon? Something about orange asses or trained or something. Well, okay. Let's go back to this. So I read it again. Yes. I don't know. What we wanted, we never got. Never really knew just what it was. It dangled there out front, an orange mirage. Well trained asses we chased. Buddha's admonishments had slipped us by. God was our mantra. But it never bought us happiness. Bills accrued along with many miseries. When it came time for the last bye bye, smiles were absent, and the ones left behind argued about all the stuff. Hmm. Should have listened to the fat man. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. The fat man. Fat man, Mr. Buddha. <laughs> yeah. Do you want another one? One more, yes. I can do. I I just I don't know what's here. I have to. Okay, here we go. These are prompted by New York. Of course, New York will do it to you. Yeah. I saw a man on the street the other day, legless. He wrestled with himself on the sidewalk. Hard to tell what he was doing. Perhaps he'd fallen from the wheelchair beside him. Clothes were filthy. Like everyone else, I passed him by, offered nothing. Heartless as the city makes us all. Wondered what thoughts traced his mind, how to cope with this, his fate. What feelings suffocated in his soul, desiccated embers of whatever dreamed he'd once had, now distilled to this, hell in a world of indifferent cruelty. A few blocks away, people chattered in classy restaurants, oblivious. How do you walk a mile in another's shoes when he has none? Mm. Mm. Yeah, like my movies, another happy family. 
your, your poems and your movies are very different, uh, you know, um, very different from each other. Um, well, the poems last well, for how many, how many? Well, that, yeah, in terms of longevity, sure. For a minute and a half and the films are long enough to put your Oh, you mean the duration, I think. <laughs> Um, um, well, as, as we approach conclusion, I mean, you're someone that you've sung, you've sung country music, you've painted, and now you're doing poems about people on the street in New York City. Is there a medium you haven't worked in? You seems like you've done you've done everything. It's I mean, I don't know. Oh, there's lots of. Uh, uh, uh. I yeah. Mean, well, I never had a job. <laughs> you never had a job. So, is, so is what you're saying is that because you didn't have a day job, is that why you're able to do all this? Is that kind of the, what the upshot? Uh, I've I had a day job for two and a half days as a dishwasher in Oslo, Norway, in a cafeteria. And wow. on Wednesday, when the lunch the lunch dishes were headed towards me, I thought I'm going to smash every dish here. I'm just going to leave and not collect my two and a half days pay. Interesting. Left, fortunately. And then I, that was one, to, and I remember when I went out of there telling myself, I think I would rather go collect berries and, and mushrooms in the woods than ever do this again. And then the other job uh, for two weeks, I was a janitor in a film studio in Chicago. Huh. Uh, and then the FBI busted me, and I went to prison. So well, that's when the that's because of the, um, that was, so that's when you first went to prison. Yeah. Well, that's because yeah. I wouldn't go to the military. Right, but right, right. As the FBI took me away, they said, "Well, we can take you to the station, the recruiting station, and you can join up." There was another guy who a, a guy who was in the National Guard, I think, and he had missed right. his whatever, so he went to go sign up, and I went to, to the to the jail. Wow. But those were the only job. And I was a professor for four years in Korea, but that Korea. was hardly, hardly a job. That was yeah. like a joke. That's, that's decent, uh, reasonably decent money and indecent lack of work. I had to teach two classes a week for three hours that required no preparation. And because I was a foreigner and quickly complained about it, uh, I didn't have to do any of the bureaucratic crap that Right. Academic people have to do. And the and the work year was seven months long. So you know, six hours a week for seven months. It's not really a job. <laughs> John, I want to thank you so much for for be for for being a guest on our unusual podcast. And um did you just well, agree? You hmm? just froze. Yeah, you froze too. I, you know, it's look, this is the Wolverine of Zooms and tech and right. And yeah, it works. And then get reanimated. We're not dead yet. <laughs> well, yeah, but I just really wanted to thank you because I wasn't expecting that poem. That's a new, that's the first time hearing it. And, and I really thank you to read it. And just basically for your time, it's been an hour and um, it went yeah. by quickly. And I really feel, um, I wish you luck in going to, you're saying you're not sure about Oslo or you said you weren't sure about your travels or Lisbon. Is that right? I'm going to Lisbon hypothetically for two weeks, and then I go to Italy. But but we don't. Know. In, in so is it is, is it a case that you have to make the plan, and then the plan might not work, but you still make the plan, and you make your best best guess? Is that it? Is it? Well, right? I bought an airplane ticket, and I'm setting exactly. up to stay with somebody. And, right. Uh, you know, but I'm perfectly prepared for them to say, "Oh, you can't come," or you know, because that's what's going well, on these days, you know. Right, but, but, but maybe that's something about what life itself is, maybe. And a strange, is that, is that a, do, do, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. Well, I'm used to it, but lots of, many people I know could not live like I do. Okay. Because they don't, they, yeah. they, they can't absorb disruption. Is it, because they, is it because they need regularity or they need some kind of system or what, is, well, what do you I think? think? Most people. Most people in our society are well trained to need regular. I think, like for example, this COVID period. Yeah. Where, you know, I never had a nine to five. You know, Friday was Sunday as far as I was concerned. It didn't make any difference. 
Okay. Uh, so it made it made very oblique, slight difference in right. that other people had jobs, and so right. I, I had to pick up on their rhythms and frequencies. That oh, Monday to Friday means something to them. It doesn't mean anything to me. A weekend doesn't mean anything to me. But I would get the echo off my friends because it did right. mean something to them. Yeah, right. But but and for me, this COVID time has turned time. My time was already pretty much like rubber. Like, you know, Wednesday, Sunday, what fucking difference does it make? Doesn't unless you have some. And, uh, but I think for people for whom the regularity of that mm -hmm. clock work was important, you know, th th they've been unmoored even more. Sort of like, right, oh, sure. It's been all of a sudden, you know, was it two weeks ago or six months ago? And they, they don't know and I don't know. Like, it's because, because time right. got. Kind of that kind of time got obliterated. Well, what what, what I would say, well, what I would say response all that is that maybe they can learn something from you. I don't know, John. John, something maybe there's wisdom in, in that. So I don't know. But um, thank you so much, and I really appreciate. My pleasure. It. Thank you, and I hope people read your poetry and see your new films, Taurus. And thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you. Let's see. We got a. You have to turn it off. Oh, I do? Well, I believe.